Hello and welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. Now I named this channel that because I wanted to expose people to the lesser known gems of sci-fi novels and short stories. Now hopefully I can do that for you. Hey, welcome to Sci-Fi Secrets. So, if I described the book Rendezvous with Rama to you, you probably wouldn't be that impressed with the storyline to be honest. But I've never had a novel like throw me for such a loop as Rendezvous with Rama has. First off, it was one of the later books I read from Arthur C. Clarke. I had read pretty much every other sci-fi book that he had written before picking this up. Part of the reason for that is because of the name. It's not a name that inspires thoughts of space, aliens, and mystery. Yet that is exactly what this book inspires in its readers. Rendezvous with Rama is about an asteroid detected by astronomers that turns out not to be an asteroid at all. The first images, from 10,000 kilometers away, brought to a halt the activities of all mankind. On a billion television screens, there appeared a tiny, featureless cylinder, growing rapidly second by second. By the time it had doubled in size, no one could pretend any longer that Rama was a natural object. Its body was a cylinder, so geometrically perfect that it might have been turned on a lathe, one with centers 50 kilometers apart. The two ends were quite flat, apart from some small structure at the center of one's face, and were 20 kilometers across. From a distance, when there was no sense of scale, Rama looked almost comically like an ordinary domestic boiler. Rama grew until it filled the screen. Its surface was a dull, drab gray, as colorless as the moon, and completely devoid of markings except for at one point. Halfway along the cylinder, there was a kilometer-wide stain or smear, as if something had once hit and splattered ages ago. There was no sign that the impact had done the slightest damage to Rama's spinning walls, but this mark had produced the slight fluctuation in brightness that had led to Stenton's discovery. The images from the other camera added nothing new. However, the trajectories their pods traced through Rama's minute gravitational field gave one other vital piece of information, the mass of the cylinder. It was far too light to be a solid body. To nobody's great surprise, it was clear that Rama must be hollow. The long hoped for, long feared encounter had finally come at last. Mankind was about to receive the first visitors from the stars. After this, they decided to send a crewed ship to land on Rama. Rama was 40 kilometers long and 20 in diameter. The scene where they do finally enter Rama will always stand out to me. What would they find inside? Would there be traps? Aggressive aliens? Why was it headed at the Earth? Is it a weapon? Will they happen to stop it or disarm it? It's literally a mystery box. Well, okay, it's literally a mystery cylinder. Chapter 8 through the hub. Never before had Norton felt so strongly his kinship with that long-dead Egyptologist. Not since Howard Carter had first peered into the tomb of Tutankhamun could any man have known the moment such as this. Yet the comparison was almost ridiculously ludicrous. Tutankhamun had been buried only yesterday, not even 4,000 years ago. Rama might be older than mankind. That little tomb in the Valley of the Kings could have been lost in the corridors through which they had already passed, but the space that lay beyond this final seal was at least a million times greater. And as for the treasure it might hold, that was beyond imagination. No one had spoken over the radio circuits for at least five minutes. The well-trained team had not even reported verbally when all the checks were complete. Mercer had simply given him the OK sign and waved him towards the open tunnel. It was as if everyone realized that this was a moment for history, not to be spoiled by unnecessary small talk. That suited Norton, for at the moment he too had nothing to say. He flicked on the beam of his flashlight, triggered his jets, and drifted slowly down the short corridor, trailing his safety line behind him. Only seconds later, he was inside. Inside what? All before him was total darkness. Not a glimmer of light was reflected back from the beam. He had expected this, but he had not really believed it. All the calculations had shown that the far wall was tens of kilometers away. Now his eyes told him that this was indeed the truth. 
As he drifted slowly into the darkness, he felt a sudden need for the reassurance of a safety line. Stronger than any he had ever experienced before, even on his first EVA. And that was ridiculous. He had looked out across the light years and the mega parsecs without vertigo. Why should he be disturbed by a few cubic kilometers of emptiness? He was queasily brooding over this problem when the momentum damper at the end of the line braked him gently to a halt, with a barely perceptible rebound. He swept the vainly probing beam of his flashlight down from the nothingness ahead to examine the surface from which he had just emerged. He might have been hovering over the center of a small crater, which was itself a dimple in the base of a much larger one. On either side rose a complex of terraces and ramps, all geometrically precise and obviously artificial, which extended for as far as the beam could reach. About a hundred meters away he could see the exits of the other two airlock systems identical with this one. And that was all. There was nothing particularly exotic or alien about the scene. In fact, it bore a considerable resemblance to an abandoned mind. He felt a vague sense of disappointment. After all this effort, there should have been some dramatic, even transcendental revelation. Then he reminded himself that he could see only a couple of hundred meters. The darkness beyond his field of view might yet contain more wonders than he cared to face. He reported briefly to his anxiously waiting companions, then added, I'm sending out the flare. Two minute delay. Here goes. With all his strength, he threw the little cylinder straight upward, or outward, and started to count seconds as it dwindled along the beam. Before he had reached the quarter minute, it was out of sight. When he had gotten to a hundred, he shielded his eyes and aimed the camera. He had always been good at estimating time. He was only two seconds off when the world exploded with light, and this time there was no cause for disappointment. Even the millions of candle power of the flare could not light up the whole of this enormous cavity, but he could see enough to grasp his plan and appreciate its titanic scale. He was at one end of the hollow cylinder at least 10 kilometers wide, and of indefinite length. From his viewpoint at the central axis, he could see such a mass of detail on the curving wall surrounding him that his mind could not absorb more than a minute fraction of it. He was looking at the landscape of an entire world by the single flash of lightning, and he had tried by a deliberate effort of will to freeze the image in his mind. All around him, the terraced slopes of crater rose up until they merged into a solid wall that rimmed the sky. No, that impression was false. He must discard the instincts of both Earth and of space and reorient himself to a new system of coordinates. He was not at the lowest part of this strange inside-out world, but the highest. From here, all directions were down, not up. If he moved away from the central axis towards the curving wall which he must no longer think of as a wall, gravity would steadily increase. When he reached the inside surface of the cylinder, he could stand upright on it at any point, feet towards the stars, and head towards the center of the spinning drum. The concept was familiar enough. Since the earliest dawn of spaceflight, centrifugal forces had been used to simulate gravity. It was only the scale of this application that was so overwhelming, so shocking. The largest of all stations, Syncast 5, was less than 200 meters in diameter. It would take some little while to grow accustomed to a hundred times that size. The tube of landscape that enclosed him was mottled with areas of light and shade that could have been forests, fields, frozen lakes, or towns. The distance and the fading illumination of the flare made identification impossible. Narrow lines could be highways, canals, or well-trimmed rivers formed a faintly visible geometric network. And far along the cylinder, at the very limit of vision, was a band of deeper darkness. It formed a complete circle, ringing the interior of this world, and Norton suddenly recalled the myth of Oceanus, the sea that the ancients believed surrounded the earth. Here, perhaps, was an even stranger sea, not circular, but cylindrical. Before it became frozen in the interstellar night, did it have waves, and tides, and currents, and fish? The flare guttered and died. The moment of revelation was over, but Norton knew that as long as he lived, these images would be burned in his mind. Whatever discoveries the future might bring, they could never erase this first impression, and history could never take from him the privilege of being the first of all mankind to gaze upon the works of an alien civilization. Once the crew was in Rama, they found that 
At the central point where they entered, there were three sets of stairs, all equally spread out leading down to the floor of the cylinder. The gravity was inconsistent inside the cylinder because it was created by the spinning of Rama. Gravity increased more and more until at the floor of the inside wall of the cylinder, it was at about 65G, or 65% of Earth's normal gravity. Now this brings up a specific scene. In one scene, one of the characters decides to use his man-powered dragonfly designed for Moon's gravity. This is basically a man-powered ultralight plane or a man-powered glider. In this scene, he wants to take his glider to the other end of Rama, but his glider isn't designed for the gravity at the surface level. His solution was to climb the stairs he entered from until he was at the axis of the cylinder. He then flies down the axis until he gets a little too off-center with his glider and can no longer handle the forces of the gravity and it collapses. I discovered a bit of confusion about this scene when I was doing my research for this video. Okay, so a little bit of background about Rama. Um, there's a few discrepancies. For example, in the book it says that it's 8 kilometers or it's about 20 kilometers or I should say it's about 8 kilometers in radius or about 20 kilometers in diameter which obviously isn't the same thing um, and he says at one point that it's spinning at about a thousand kilometers per hour he also says that it has about 0 0.65 G so if you put all that into this uh, spin calculator online that I found then you start to run into some problems with um, what he was saying. Because if it's eight kilometers here, for example, he does say it's spinning at 0.25 RPM. So if it's at eight kilometers, then it's uh, the ground is traveling at about 753 kilometers per hour. And the centripetal acceleration, or the Gs, would be about 0.55, not 0.65. So, the one thing that he says a few times is um, 0.65G. So, to get 0.65G, what I've found is you have to have the radius at around 9.5 kilometers, and then you get 0.66G, and then the tangential velocity is spinning at 895 kilometers per hour. So, this is a bit closer to the 1,000 kilometers per hour that he says, and the 0.65G and the um so the ship ha basically the interior of the ship would have to be about 9.5 kilometers in radius to get the numbers that he has which i guess makes sense because the skin of the ship i guess would make up the other half a kilometer so a quarter kilometer on each side so anyway um yeah that's that's apparently how big the ship is is about t uh, 10 kilometers in radius so, I, like I said, I know there's a little bit of conflicting information if you put all the numbers in. It doesn't all work out quite right. But I figure 895 is close enough to 1,000. 6.6 or 6.66 is close enough to uh, 0.65. And then we got, the, like I said, the 9.5 kind of works. So this seems to be the size of the interior of the ship. Um, at least that's the numbers that I'm going to go with. Okay, now back to the original problem of his falling glider. What do you think would happen if he was sitting there in the air a few kilometers above the ground and he didn't have anything to keep him up? So like I said, his glider breaks. What would happen in that case? A, would he fall straight down without rotating with the cylinder so that when he hit the floor, he was smeared into paste by the ground that would be traveling over 750 kilometers per hour? B, would he just float in the air and never fall at all, since he's not touching anything that would induce the spin to cause the artificial gravity? Or C, would he fall in a spiral so that when he hits the ground, he would be traveling at almost the exact same speed as the ground and just hit straight down into the floor? The answer is C, and this is why. A would only happen if the interior of Rama was a perfect vacuum like space. But since there is air inside Rama, the only force acting on the glider is the friction between it and the air. And the air is spinning in perfect sync with Rama, because the only force acting on it is the friction between it and the floor. There is no second force acting on the glider to slow it down. The friction in this case would keep it moving with Rama. So the glider, even though in the air, is still part of the interior system of Rama and would continue to rotate with it. B would only happen if the glider was very near or directly on the central axis that Rama spins on. But as it gets lower, as it did in the story, 
As I previously stated, the air would keep the glider spinning in sync with Rama, and it would still feel the effects of Rama's artificial gravity induced by that spin. So Arthur C. Clarke got this perfectly correct, as he did with pretty much the entirety of the book. On my hard sci-fi meter, this book gets a 9 out of 10. The most scientifically questionable part is the makeup of the Hall of Rama. Physics has limits, and if the marks on the outside of the hall really are from an asteroid impact, then there should have been some scarring. The fact that the mark is still there, but there is no damage seems to surpass the laws of physics, but maybe I'm missing something. If you want to know the rest of the story, I strongly encourage you to read this book. But don't worry about the sequels too much. They are very fun reads, but like many sci-fi series, they end up straying into the edges of fantasy after a few books. And since this channel is more about the hardest of sci-fi, it will probably be a while before I cover them.